Hello Brain Shakers, welcome to the Brain Shakers Academy where we're going to be looking at the production of the CSF or the cerebral spinal fluid. Now what is the cerebral spinal fluid? The cerebral spinal fluid is a clear and colorless plasma-like and I'm saying plasma-like because it has elements of it that appear more in the uh, manner that a plasma would appear, but then differs in the levels of glucose, ions, electrolytes, and also the levels and amounts of oxygen that they do possess. Now, we are going to be looking at the production of that CSF. Where is it coming from and in what amounts it, it should be produced and what are the main functions of that particular CSF. Let's dive into today's session and appreciate that. So I have a diagram with me here that is going to help us understand the CSF production. It is important that by the time you're coming to understand the production of the CSF, you have also looked at the other video where I have looked at the different meninges, where we looked at the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater, because it is important in this session that you know about those meninges. And I will attach a link as well in the description for the uh, meninges as well. We know that the pia mater, which is the innermost layer of the meninges, makes invaginations into the brain tissue. That simply means that if we have our brain tissue here, we know that the pia mater is going to make those invaginations in the brain tissue, okay? So these invaginations that we see here are important elements and they are in most cases going to be surrounded by an, an important complex that we call a plexus. Now, this cut here is exactly what we are mimicking here to represent the pia mater that is then surrounded by that plexus that we will now call the choroid plexus. So this is going to be called the choroid plexus. Now, what forms the choroid plexus? What forms the choroid plexus is that you have a very good layer of cells around that pia mater, and these cells are the cells that we are going to call the ependymal cells. So these will be ependymal cells. And from the ependymal cells, then you obviously have the pia mater as well. Okay, so you have the pia mater, and then especially this type of pia mater that we are calling the telechoroidea. Okay, that is the pia mater, and then you have the fenestrated blood vessels there. So you have fenestrated blood vessels, which are fenestrated capillaries. Okay, very important because remember we did make mention that it is a plasma-like, it's a clear colorless plasma-like element. And within these capillaries, you will find that there is plasma there. So we need a little amount of filtrate from there and chemical elements from there for the ependymal cells then to be able to produce that uh, CSF. Now, within this also, we can add a basement membrane here because we are about to make another barrier that we are going to talk about, uh, which is the blood-brain barrier, and then we'll also talk about the uh, blood CSF barrier. So that is basically what you're going to find in the choroid plexus. So it will appear more or less like this. If we make a cross-section of those invaginations of the pia mater, then we will have something like this. So you have these ependymal cells that you are going to find here. They will be attached one to another by important elements that we call tight junctions. So they will have tight junctions among us. So you have tight junctions here. And the purpose of these tight junctions that are holding these ependymal cells, one cell to the other, is to be able to create a barrier that we call the blood CSF barrier. Now, I must make mention that the blood CSF barrier is different from the blood brain barrier. 
So these are two different barriers. Now, what is the blood CSF barrier? The blood CSF barrier is just the ependymal cells and their tight junctions, meaning that they are restricting the movement of substances from the CSF. This is going to be within the ventricle, by the way. This is going to be the ventricular surface or within the channel of the ventricle because this is an invagination of the uh, pia mater. So the blood CSF barrier is then going to be created by the ependymal cells and their tight junctions, restricting the movement of CSF elements into the blood and also the movement of larger molecules from the uh, capillaries here into the CSF altering the electrolyte environment and balance there. So that is the blood CSF barrier. Now, you also have the blood brain barrier, which is a selectively permeable uh, barrier as well. This is the entire layer. So we are going to hold this entire layer as the blood brain barrier meaning that you have the basement membrane, you have the fenestrated capillaries, the pia mater or the telechoroidea, which has actually loose connective tissue within it, and then you have the ependymal cells. Then when it comes to the blood CSF barrier, it is just an element of the blood brain barrier. So those are the barriers that you should not confuse one with the other. Now, you're going to find that this choroid plexus that we are talking about is situated in the ventricles. When you're looking at the ventricular system of the brain, you have the four main ventricles. That is, you have two lateral ventricles, that is the left and the right, then you will have a third ventricle and you will have the fourth ventricle. When you look at the two lateral ventricles, the choroid plexus is actually going to be found within the lateral ventricles, but in the third and fourth ventricle, you will find the choroid plexus on the roof. You find it on the rooftop of the two ventricles, that is the third and the fourth. And so most of the cerebrospinal fluid that is going to be formed is going to be formed by the choroid plexus that you will find in all the four main ventricles. Now what is going to be happening here is that there is going to be a filtrate that is going to be coming from these fenestrated uh, blood vessels that will have a composition of ions, electrolytes, oxygen, and those other elements that are important for the formation of the CSF coming into the ependymal cells. And the ependymal cells are getting enough chemical elements from these fenestrated uh, blood vessels so that they can form the CSF. So the CSF now is not just just an ultra filtrate of blood, but then it will have the rightful composition because of the specialized cells of the ependymal cells, also referred to as the choroid cells. So these cells, the ependymal cells, play a key role in the production of that uh, cerebral spinal fluid. And we have to make mention also that the CSF has to be maintained in normal amounts. And this production is going to be at levels of about 0.2 to about 0.7 mils, that is every minute. That will culminate into approximately 600 mils to about 700 mils per day. So you're producing about 600 to about 700 mils of that CSF. But then you do not need all this CSF. The normal amount or average range that you will need is just between 150 mils to about 270 mils. So this is what you will need at any given time you will need about 150 to about 270 mils. Then what should happen for you to have this um, amount of CSF? It means that there has to be turning over of this CSF. It has to be absorbed at some certain elements and then gotten rid of the system as more is being produced so that you can have a normal amount of CSF. And this CSF is then going to be maintained within 150 50 to about 270. So if you have to maintain it at this level, it means that you have to over 10 the CSF approximately four to about five times every day for you to maintain uh, the normal levels. There are obviously consequences if you have extra amount of 
um, uh, CSF. Now, what are the functions of the CSF or the cerebral spinal fluid? Now, some of the functions of the cerebral spinal fluid are to act as a shock absorber because they will be circulating in the subarachnoid uh, um, space there and as it is circulating in the subarachnoid space it is making sure that the brain is protected from all manner of shock so for shock absorption there and then it also maintains neutral buoyancy Okay, that is just basically preventing the brain tissue from compressing the blood vessels and the nerves that are circulating there. And then the other thing is that it acts as a transport media. So transport media or for transportation. What is it transporting? It is transporting neuromodulators and neurotransmitters as well. It plays key role also in the process of elimination what is coming in from the brain tissue into the CSF then will be gotten read through the arachnoid uh, granulations because they will have to deposit it into the cerebral venous sinuses and this same CSF is very important for clinical diagnosis so we can also use it in clinical diagnosis now under clinical diagnosis what you will be doing is we did discuss when we were looking at the meninges there's a lumbar system around the uh, L1 to about S2 where you will be performing a lumbar puncture so if you did a lumbar puncture and collected some cerebral spinal fluid from there then you will be able to do biological uh, microbiological and cytological analysis there just to help you come up with uh, clinical diagnosis so basically that is about the production of the CSF so it is being produced by the choroid plexus which plays a key role in also the formation of the blood brain barrier and the blood CSF barrier so the plexus themselves they will have the pendimo cells circulating and going around those pyoinvaginations and making sure that those pendimo cells are holding on to the basement membrane like any other cell that forms a tissue and that is about the production of the CSF and in normal amounts and volumes that are supposed to be circulating at any given time. Now if you found this particular video helpful in understanding the production of the cerebral spinal fluid where it is coming from which cells are particularly involved in its production and what normal amounts are supposed to be then don't hesitate to give me a comment in the comments section drop your thumbs up there and share the video as much as possible and also head on to the youtube channel and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the flow of the csf because that is exactly what i will be looking at next and as always thank you and i will see you in the next one